Good morning, Sovik. So uh, I think it's uh, exactly 6.31, right? Uh, with me, there is Dr. Soros Ghosh on behalf of Geological Association of Part 1, as well as uh, Dr. Manavest Mojumdar. So in order to introduce you with the other uh, members of the Geological Association of Part 1, so um, Dr. Ghosh and Dr. Mojumdar are there. Shall we start the um, seminar? Dr. Yes, yes, yes. So, we, yeah, Sam, we, we okay. So, um, so let us start the meeting. Mm. All right. So, good evening to everyone. So, today the task of introducing our guest of honor and speaker is a great privilege for this session organized by the Geological Association of Badawan. Mm. I feel glad to introduce our speaker, who also happened to be my junior in the college. Today, we have Dr. Sobhi Bhattacharya currently serving as a research associate in the University of Texas at Austin, United States. Dr. Vattacharya, after passing his bachelor degree from Vivekananda Mohavidyalaya, Badwan completed his master's from the Benaros Hindu University, followed by which he pursued the doctoral degree from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Dr. Vattacharya has authored numerous mm. publications in peer-reviewed journals, which are of international repute with very high standard. He also served as an editor and reviewer in many scientific journals. We would also like to convey a sincere thanks to all the attendees who are making this session successful. Dr. Sobhik Bhattacharya will speak on the Lotka Volterra model for competition. Dr. Bhattacharya, please continue. Oh, uh, am I audible to everyone? Yes, you are. Okay, great. Let me start the presentation. It's visible, right? Yes, it is. All right. So let me start by thanking the ZAB, or Zoological Association of Bird One, for uh, uh, mm. inviting me to deliver this lecture, especially Siamda for hosting me. Uh, I once was an active member of ZAB, and when I was a, a member when during my undergraduate studies, the library of ZAB really helped me a lot regarding uh, course uh, subjects and literature surveys, etc. So uh, before I begin with the topic that is a lot of alter equation for competition, uh, I would like to mm -hmm. um, just give an anecdote or uh, share something that is uh, close to us, that close to me, that is Austin. So. For the people who do not know, I am right now here in the US, uh, south, southern part of the US. This is Austin. And we zoologists always think about uh, animals and stuff. So I'm sharing. So Austin is uh, actually the home for Mexican free tail bats, which migrate during the winter season from the uh, center or northern region of US towards the Mexico. And, uh, but for four or five months during the year, they reside at various pockets in between. So one such place is Austin, where about 10 to 15, mil, uh, 10 to 15 uh, lakhs of bats actually reside just under one bridge. And you can uh, visit the, them every year. So that's just one uh, uh, information that I just wanted to share with the students of zoology. So now I'm going to go into the topic and, uh, bef uh, and before I start uh, discussing about that uh, Lotka Volter equation, what uh, I'd like to point out is that what you may learn in this lecture. Uh, I'm talking about the students uh, who I to study this topic. I, I'm, I always think this before I start uh, understanding or trying to understand the concept that why should I study this what how is going to help me so we'll go into that also the basic concept of the model or the equations or how that equation can be used to uh, interpret different aspects of biology and then third uh, that would be 
one of my primary goals is that to introduce you to the world of mathematical modeling. When I was a student, especially from places like Vardhavan, uh, uh, this was uh, not very well introduced to the students. Students avoided it for some reason. And we, I felt a disconnect when I grew up as a student. I felt a disconnect when I started uh, doing experiments, finding out that there is a big, vast world of mathematical modeling and uh, uses of mathematical modeling that we do not appreciate, we do not understand, do not learn. So, in today's lecture, I will try to uh, see whether. Uh, I can motivate you to pick up this subject and uh, read yourself. What I'm not going to do today, what is not the purpose of this lecture, is uh, let you feel or let you know how to write in exams. That's not, fo not the focus of this uh, lecture. We'll not be able to find out anything new that will, you already have books and notes that will help you. Uh, my focus would be to make you f understand different concepts associated with it. Uh, this is also not the purpose of this lecture, that is how to easily memorize the mathematical section. And third is that it is not the purpose of this lecture is to not let you ask me questions. So this is an open forum. I want you to ask me questions anytime you want, just stop. Mm -hmm. Um, unmute yourself and ask me the question and I will not feel interrupted it will be great if you can if you have any questions I'd be happy to answer them also uh, the thing is if you have a problem with the lang with language I have a problem with the language what I want from you is you just ask Banglai question Goro not a problem let's have a discussion all right so in today's talk I'm going to talk about five different things, uh, connected five different things. First, I'm going to talk about mathematical modeling and how, and very basic concepts of it, so that we can understand what the Lotka Voltaire model is all about. Then I'm going to talk about ecological concepts of growth and competition in a very brief, so that we can actually go to the main topic, that is Lotka Voltaire. And then we are going to see how Lotka Voltaire models can be used in different aspects of biology, and you'll be stunned to find out uh, the extreme examples of the application that uh, uh, people have done using Lotka Voltaire models. And finally, we'll conclude and get some take home messages from this lecture. All right, so first, mathematical modeling. So for this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start uh, with an introduction, what is a mathematical model, and how to build one. This is the, uh, uh, so whenever I, was, whenever I was trying to prepare for this lecture, uh, this came to my mind. Whenever uh, I take classes here for a mathematical model, or like, you know, and I, I ask this question to the students, and it, this is called a Fermi question. A famous scientist, Enrico Fermi, uh, popularized this mode of questioning or modeling. And I made this question to be specific to Bordoman. And let's see whether you can uh, like, try to answer this. Is it possible for you to guess how many TV repair mechanics are there in Bordoman town right now? I'm going to just give you one information that is Give or take, the population of Bardhaman is about 4 lakhs of 400,000. Is it for possible for you to... Uh, no. If you think you know the answer, you can do it. Just uh, chat, write in the chat. Is it possible? Yes or no? Is it a weird question? Well, let's see. So... Let's start off with some uh, with using some with some assumptions. Yes. No. So the population is four hundred thousand or four lakhs. If there are on average four people per family, then there are hundred thousand families in Bordaman. And if each family wants 
owns one TV on average. There can be many, many families which do not have TV. There can be many families which have more than one TV. Then the, and so on average, if each family owns one TV, then the total TV would be about 100,000. And each TV needs repaired. This is also our assumption. Once in every four years. So every year, the TV number of TV repaired would be 25,000. And if a mechanic um, who is there is going to repair it, repairs two TVs a day because he's also an electrical mechanic, so he has other things to do. So he can only perform two TV repairs a day. He does that five days a week, 50 weeks a year. Then the total TV repaired by that mechanic is about 500. So we can actually guesstimate, guess estimate that number of TV repair mechanics would be about 50. And if we are like four to five times within the range of error, like if, let's say there are 250 mechanics in, uh, in Bardhaman, then we are close. We did a very good job. And this is one example of mathematical modeling. We had some estimate starting from some very simple assumptions. The original question that was asked by Enrico Fermi was how many piano tuners are there in Chicago? So the people who can fix the piano and tune the piano. And uh, Enrico Fermi asked, can we just, just sit on a sofa and calculate out just by thinking how many piano tuners there are possible? I just changed that question to suit uh, the audience here. So. That was an example of mathematical modeling. What mathematical modeling is, is that you take information from real world. So there are some observations. Then you conceptualize it. You f have a framework. Uh, like we, we had some information from the real world, like there are 400,000 people in Bartuman. Then you con conceptualize it. That is, you have some observations like, OK, there may be on average four people. Uh, per uh, family, then you have a model, then you predict, and then you go back and check whether that is true or not. And that's the way the science of mathematical modeling works. So mathematical model is a representation of a system with a set of equations that correspond to hypothesized relationships among systems components. And it's different from natural experiment because in natural experiment, is an, it is an approach to hy hypothesis testing. That means you have an hypothesis here. There is a prediction in the conceptual world that relies on the phenomena that you have initially observed. Now, whether your concepts are correct or not, that would be tested by experiments. So there are three components to mathematical modeling. And that is important for even Lotka Valtera model, we'll see. First is postulates, there are, then there are distributions, and there are coefficients. So in the previous example we just saw about TV repair mechanic, the postulate that we had was each family wants one TV. That was our postulate. It, it, is to, it has to be there, otherwise our estimate will be very off. Then we had a distribution. So distribution here means the probability. So what is the probability of a number of individuals in a family? We assumed that it is four. So the number of uh, family, a number of families that we calculated was calculated from a probability distribution. We'll discuss that in little detail later. And then we had a coefficient, and that is total TV repaired per year. So using postulates and distributions and some assumptions, we could go to, we, we could hypothesize something, and we made a coefficient, and then we calculated out something. So, so these are the three different components of mathematical modeling. So postulates are basically logic, and if your logic fails, then you go back and form a new postulate until you make it right. So that way, mathematical modeling and experiments can go hand in hand by correcting and uh, in incorporating improvements in the model uh, every time a new iteration is made. Distribution, on the other hand, are just calculations of probabilities. 
So that means you have uh, many different kinds of distributions. And uh, why I'm talking about this? Because we'll take some information from here, and we're going to apply this to uh, the lot Cavalchera model. So there are many kinds of distributions. Uh, we'll just talk about few. So there, there are probabilities like uniform distributions, like a deck of cards, when every you have every card has equal probability of drawing out out by you. So you just blind, blindly pick a card, and you can have one by fifty-two uh, possibility of uh, drawing that card. That's that's and that would be same for every card. So that is uniform, and this kind of probability can be applied to various different things. I just pointed out one like a lottery or in casinos. Then there can be uh, distributions like discrete distributions called as Bernoulli distributions where there are only two events like tossing a coin. So there can be either heads or tails. And these kinds of binary or discrete, there are only two events that are happening. So you're calculating what are the chances of happening either head or the tail. That percentage can be calculated, and this kind of distribution can be used in computations, writing different algorithms, and many other uh, processes such as electrical circuits and stuff. Also, we have very popular normal or Gaussian distribution, where the population will have uh, the majority of the population will fall into this area. So this is the graph that uh, shows the Gaussian distribution. Examples would be uh, uh, the height of humans, also how antibiotics uh, kill bacteria. So there are very different ways. I just uh, made a simple statement here, but that's a very complicated thing that is used to understand how antibiotics and bacteria can uh, like have a uh, ecological competition. Then there are portion distributions. So portion distribution is nothing but uh, frequency or probability of finding out discrete events uh, that is happening in one instance. Like how many leaves there are one branch of a tree. That is a portion distribution. And that can be calculated out. And using portion distributions, weather forecasts are made. So there are real life. So these are examples that you can follow on the left. And these are real life examples of usage of these distributions. One such probability distribution or equations are called as Kolmogorov equations. Uh, this uh, seminar, we don't have enough time to go into that. But this is the basis of lotka Valtera model, uh, who independently used the basis of Kolmogorov equations and utilized that to make their assumptions and mathematical models. So lotka Valtera just wanted to use a specific type of probability distribution to predict the future, predict the outcome later. And then there are, as I said, there are three components. The third component is coefficients, which is nothing but the rules or theories that you make out of your assumptions and uh, after finding out or calculating out your probabilities. So going to the second part, that is growth and competition. So this is a lecture on itself. Uh, I'm just going to briefly touch upon this so that we can actually go to lotka Hunter volter model. And this is the only information we know we need to know uh, to understand lotka Hunter volter model. So n is the size of a population. That means, let's say, uh, there are 10 deers in Ravana Bagan in Bardhavan. So that's the, so the N, a capital N, or the size of the deer population in Ravana Bagan in Bardhavan is 10. And let's say every year one new deer is born. 
So the growth rate would be uh, the change ev that is happening every year uh, divided by the total size of the population. So that let's say if there is one uh, deer that is being born every year and there are total 10 deers in, in the Ramana Bagan, then the growth rate would be 1 divided by 10, that is 0 0.1, 0 0.1. So, change in population is always calculated, and if you have taken courses in calculus, you will know that you can write a change, small changes in anything using differential component of, uh, of an equation. So, dn by dt, that is the change in n over time, can be written as a product or multiplication of R, that is the growth rate, and N, that is the size of the population. So in case of the deer population in Ramana Bagan, the R was 0 0.1 and N was 10. So that means the change in population would be 0 0.1 multiplied by 10. And that's it. So every year it's going to increase 1 in its population. Generally, N and R, if the environment does not change and there is no specific, like, drastic events happening, due to evolution, the R remains relatively constant and the population itself tries to achieve an equilibrium where the N is very stable. Uh, but, uh, in theory, if a population is growing const constantly, continuously, if there are no limits, there is no limits of resources, and there is uh, no selection pressure that is happening, then what you get is an exponential growth, where the population size will increase over time exponentially, and you will get a J-shaped curve. You can see this is J-shaped. But this is theoretical, and not, I mean, it's, it's possible, and we do see examples of that, but it is followed by some other events. Because if this was true for one organism, that that organism would have just grown, grown, and grown, and would never cease to exist. What happens is that there is a concept called as carrying capacity. That means, in every situation, depending on, in, on the environment, there is a limit to the number of organisms of a species that can exist there. That is the maximum number of n, n max. That is also called as k or carrying capacity. And now you can change this equation by introducing a carrying capacity coefficient. And, that, and this is called as the model of logistic growth. Why? Because you are actually using logistics or some you're taking into consideration what, what is happening in the environment to fit or, or to calculate out your model. And you can see the same equation as seen on the left is there on the right as well. It's just that there is a coefficient of k that has been applied. So, take, so what is this coefficient? Why did we apply this? So just think of an example, when k is far greater than n, that means n is very close to 0, then it is, the n will become 0, so k by k will become 1, so this equation would be same as this equation, so there is no change. So that means when the population is just at the initial phase, then there is no limit to its growth, it's going to grow. But as the growth increases, the n will increase, so this value of 1 will decrease and go towards some value. Not 0, it will not become 0, may become 0, but generally it doesn't become 0. So what will happen, a, a number, the number of uh, organisms that was increasing over time, will decrease because the carrying capacity is being approached. So that's why what you'll find is a sigmoidal curve, or S-shaped curve, where you'll find that uh, after a while the population is re reaching a limit. So let's take some example uh, and of 
whether what kind of approaches uh, organisms take during for their growth in uh, in the nature and actually organisms take both of these uh, approaches and we'll see the examples so this the organisms which take the uh, the the j-shaped curve is called as the r selected population because they have uh, they have been selected to grow like that. The natural selection has fine-tuned their growth and death cycle in such a way that they, they grow like that. And you can have many examples. This is the theoretical uh, model, but that's not true. After a while, as I said before, this is theoretical. After a while, it's going to reach a, a phase where it cannot grow exponentially anymore. And what can happen is it can go through cycles of phases like this. So it grew, then it died off, then it grew, then it died off, then it grew and died off. These are called as growth and bust cycles. And one example would be uh, the growth of lemmings that are found in Arctic, where they grow and die with seasonal changes. Or there can be examples of exponential growth followed by a little bit of death and some fluctuations in uh, when it's reaching the carrying capacity and the example would be meerkat in uh, African savannas whereas uh, the majority of the organisms follow this case selected growth where there is a lag phase followed by a, a log phase followed by a plateau because it is reaching the carrying capacity, the environment cannot sustain more individuals than it's there. And there can be variations to that, like this. There are many plants which grow like that, or it can look like a, almost like a straight line. All, it looks like a straight line, but it's not, because there are, uh, like, it's a big, very sloppy, long, a shaped curve. And we're just looking at a small section of it, and that's why it looks like that. One example would be human growth. So various growth strategies are applied by organisms for survival in natural environment. But if it was the only interaction of the organism and the environment, then we could have predicted their growth easily. That's our goal. We want to predict how well an organism grows. But uh, it's, the situation is not, not simple at all because there are multiple species which, who are competing against each other and also uh, the environment is always fluctuating or changing. So that means we have to incorporate those things into our model or mathem mathematical model also if you want to predict what happens to an organism. For example, we can either we can fairly predict what will be the number of lemmings in a certain time of the year because we already know how, how it grows. So we have a mathematical model and we can predict the growth of lemmings in an, um, and um, Arctic circles. But uh, not all organ we cannot, we, we will not be able to predict all organisms growth using just simple models like this. Because as I said, there is a change in the environment, but also there is competition. There are two types of competition that is happening in nature. One is intraspecific competition. Lemmings are fighting with other lemmings. Uh, that is part of the growth dependence that you saw before. So the carrying capacity is part of it. What we are interested for this lecture is interspecific competition where competition is among individuals of a different species. So two different species or multiple different species are fighting against each other or competing against each other for survival. And there could be many different outcomes. The question then becomes, can we use mathematical models to predict who is going to do what, how, how well a species would, is going to do or perform in a specific scenario. So let's say this is species one and let's say this is species two and there can be so there can be intraspecific 
in competitions or there can be inter-specific competitions. Species 1 and species 2 are interacting with each other. But it may be either symmetric or asymmetric. That means mm, both are equal, they're fighting off each other very nicely, they, they can fight each other very nicely, or, which is more common, one is winning against the other, so what is happening is this is fighting and uh, winning against the, uh, this one. So there can be asymmetric competition, and that way one species will outcompete other species. But this is very qualitative or generic way of saying who is going to win, who is going to lose, who is going to survive. Can we actually use mathematical models to predict this? Well, there are some more things to consider before you go there, and that is there can be what kind of interactions are we talking about? So there can be interference competition, like so I've just used a random example. Let's say there is a patch of grass that can be eaten by a cow or a horse. And let's say the cow and horse are actually physically fighting against each other and not allowing each other to eat the grass. In that a specific scenario will be interference competition because the cow is actively interfering or the act, actively interfering the horse or vice versa from eating the grass. The second example is uh, exploitative competition where <clears throat> The cow has eaten all the grass, so the horse can't eat anything. So they are using the same resource, and because the resource has been utilized, there is nothing left for it. So although they were not actively competing for it, there was competition. And third is apparent competition. So the cow and the horse are on two sides of the grass. They are trying to feed the grass. It, it may appear to you they are in competition, but maybe the, there is a controller, like a human, who is the cattle grazer, and who is controlling how they behave, and so it may be there is a competition, but actually it's not. There are fine-tuning factors which will control it, and there is basically less amount of competition. So there are different possibilities that exist when organisms interact with, different species interact with each other. So let's go into the lotkin Volterra model. So this is the background that we have. We know a little bit of mathemat about what mathematical modeling is, what you can expect from mathematical model, and what uh, a basic idea about growth and competition in ecology. And let's uh, go into uh, Lotka and Volterra. So this is uh, Alfred Lotka and Volterra. And if you want to read a nice book about how they came about their mod modeling, the history about it, you can read this book, Modeling Nature. They calculated this separately. Lotka was a insurance company calculation expert in New York, and Vito Volterra was a professor of statistics in uh, Italy. So, as I said, in a model, there are different the mathematical model, there are three different things. So let's look at ex this example. There is a snake species and there is a rat species. And Lotka and Volterra had three, these three things in their model. The for postulate one was that species one will affect the number of population of species two. So there is a competition, the predator-prey predator model. So the number of uh, rats will be affected by how many number of snakes are there. Second is the distribution. Remember, we discussed about Kolmogorov uh, equations where we, we discussed how probabilities can be uh, calculated. So there are a set of equations called as Kolmogorov equations. Those kinds of equations were utilized by Lotka and Volterra to come to their model. And they generated this coefficient called as coefficient of competition. So this is uh, the basic model for species one growth that we have already discussed. The change in population that is dn1, because this was species one, over time is r1, the growth rate of species one, and n1, that is the population size, multiplied by k1 minus n1 over k1, where k1 is the carrying capacity of species one. I would have loved to use board and give this lecture to you in person because 
this needs writing on the board. Unfortunately, we are living in a world where we have to do it like this. So, what Lotkin Volterra did is that they introduced this factor, coefficient of competition, where they said that the number of individuals and how they are competing against each other will also impact how the change in the number of individuals is happening over time within a population. So not only the carrying capacity will control the growth of that population, but also the competition and the number of individuals of the species 2 will control how many species 1 individuals are there. So that is, this alpha is called as the coefficient of competition. Same way you can calculate for uh, species 2 and here, for example, we are calling it as beta and this species has its own uh, population size that is N2, own growth rate that is R2 and own carrying capacity that is K2 which are all different from species 1. So this is our equation and uh, Lotka Volteria, uh, Volterra argued that let's see what happens in an equilibrium. That means when there is no change in uh, the number of species. So all of them are at, like equal at the same time. What will happen? Can we calculate out from something from there? So when dn by dt becomes zero, that means the entire thing becomes zero, which means there are three possibilities. R1 is zero, N1 is zero, or this part of the equation is zero. Then only this can be zero. But in Lotka Volterra model, R1 cannot be zero and N1 cannot be zero. So that means this component of the equation must be zero. So from there, you can simplify. So K1 goes here, and so it, it, it becomes K1 minus N1 minus alpha N2. Finally, you get K1 minus alpha N2. And what, uh, that equals n1. So you can write rewrite this equation in this way: n1, that is the number of population in species one, is equal to k1, that is the carrying capacity, minus alpha n2. And alpha n2 is the contributing factor from species two. This equation should look similar to you because it is similar. It is almost like y equals to mx plus c where this part is the y, this part is the mx, although this is negative, this is not positive, so it's y equals to neg uh, negative component of mx plus, and this is the c. So if we now plot n1 and n2, that is y and x, we will expect a straight line. And the straight line will have a slope, and the slope will be m or alpha. Let's look. So if we plot the number of individuals that are present in a population of species 1 on x-axis and number of individuals that are present uh, in a population of species 2 on y-axis, n1 and n2, assuming that there is no change in either of the numbers, that is dn by d2 is 0. So for example, let's look at for n1, when dn1 by d2 is 0, we can use this e y equals to mx plus c type of equation to get a straight line. Because this is negative, it will become a slope. Not only that, you see that this line intersects where n2, that is the value of y, is 0. All the values of y on x-axis is 0. So here, n2 is 0. That means here, n1 becomes k1. And that means this is k1. Similarly, on this side, n1 is 0. Because all the values of x on y-axis are 0. So this is where n1 component of the equation is 0. So this becomes alpha n2 equals to k1. So that means n2 equals to k1 by alpha. So this is k1 by alpha. So these are the two components of a lotka volterra plot. Uh, we have to remember this. 
so that you can apply this uh, in the later models. Now, the second part of this is you can apply the same thing for species two. That is uh, for so you will get k2 on the y-axis and k2 by beta on x-axis. So now, if you want to see what happens to both the species who are like coexisting together, you will get what we call as isoclines, where there are two lines which have similar types of slopes. They are not meeting each other. And there are four possibilities that exist with it. There are various different kinds of possibilities, but we are going to talk about mainly four. So what does this uh, uh, plot mean, and how, what can we infer from this kind of uh, analysis? So what Lotka Volterra assumed is that along this line, if you take any value of n1 and n2, that is number of species, a uh, number of um, individuals of, of species, the values, uh, uh, the species will be at equilibrium. Both the species will be at equilibrium. Their total number will not change. So this line represents where no species will either win or lose. There is unchanging. But if there is a situation of a, like uh, where the number of individuals is this, or number of individuals for uh, species one is this, and number of individuals for species two is this, which is below this line, that is this dot, then species one will win, and this is signified, symbolized as this arrow, indicating growth in x-axis. If there is a growth in y-axis, then it will be symbolized in other way. So that will happen if the number of individuals are here. So Uh, dear students, I think our speaker might have some problems, uh, might have some technical problems. So we'll wait till he rejoins and start the seminar.
Dear students, so I think we had been watching the Lotka Volterra model for competition by Dr. Sovik Bhattacharya. So I think he might have some technical problems. Uh, so we'll be waiting till he rejoins. And you can also watch the seminar on YouTube because we have been recording and going to upload it in our channel. Hello, Sam. Hello, Sam. Hello. Hello. Hello, Soroj. Hello. Uh, is there, is there Sam uh, is Sam present in the seminar? I think Sam is out. I'm, I'm right now. Yes, I'm trying to contact the speaker actually. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Is there any way to contact with the speaker? Let us try. Uh, it is almost at the. Uh, it is almost at the end of the lecture. So, I think we we do require the conclusion. Sobik is visible. Yes, you are. But I think you'll have to unmute because you're not able to listen to you. Okay, so uh, when did I get cut off from the talk? Mm, wait. Can you can you hear me now? Yes, we can. All right. Uh, I'm unable to share my screen. Uh, can you give me permission to do the screen share? Yes, please go ahead. I can't. There's something going on. All right, should be good now. Is it visible now? Not really. It's coming, yes, yes. Uh, what was the last slide that you could see? No, I think we we'll go back. Back? Yes, please go back. Yes. This was yes, the. Please continue. All right. Okay. Sorry about that. I didn't know that I was just disc like disconnected. I didn't see any problems in here. Okay. So um, uh, I'll just re repeat. So. 
if the the number of individuals are below this isocline line then it is the number of individuals are going to increase over time and if the number of if the number of individuals are above this line then the number of individuals are going to increase so below the isocline means increase above the isocline is decrease so similarly we can use uh, uh, for species 2 and you can have four different scenarios F for in the first situation so i'm repeating this i didn't know that i got disconnected let me see mm. Well, my screen is visible, right? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. So let's look at this situation where the, this red dot means that this is the number of individuals in, in, one, uh, in species 1 and species 2. And this is below both of these lines. So that means species 1 and 2 both are going to survive and will try to reach towards equilibrium here. But if it is above these two lines, then both of the species are going to lose out and they are going to come to this equilibrium. And these arrows indicate that. But in this intermediate zone, which is above blue, uh, yellow line but below blue line, species 1, which is the blue line, is going to win because it is below the blue line. You remember, if you remember, we discussed this. Uh, this below I isocline is increase above isocline is decrease so you can see that here below isocline there is increase and above isocline is decrease in this situation it is below isocline one that is the blue one above isocline two that is the yellow one and that's why the blue one is going to win so species 1 is going to win. So then there is a second scenario where the blue line is on the top and the reverse is going to happen. So blue uh, so in this scenario both the species are going to win. In this scenario both the species are going to lose and will try to come to this uh, uh, equilibrium. And intermediate, this is below yellow and above blue line. So that means it, because it is below yellow, the yellow one is going to win. So this is situation two. If, if situation one and two both had parallel lines, but not necessarily there should be parallel lines all the time, unless they intersect across each other, the same set of principles can be applied. But let's look at a situation where the lines cross, that is situation 3. And uh, so there are four segments now, one, two, three, four. In this first segment... Uh, Sobhika, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, are you changing the slide? Yes, I am. I think it's not reflected in the screen. Can you please uh, reshare the power presentation? Yes. I'm so sorry, I don't know what is happening. Uh, is it visible now? The screen? Yes, it is. And is it changing? Yes. Okay. Oh my God. All right. So, uh, this is situation one where the species one wins because the blue line is above the yellow line and this is situation two where the second species wins because the yellow line is above blue line uh, because in most of the situations so in the first two instances both will either win or both will either lose but in the intermediate zone, the blue, yellow will win. So these two instances, species one and two, will win. In this, but on th these first two examples where we saw that uh, two lines are not intersecting with each other, right? So that means these lines, until they intersect, the same set of principles can be applied. 
Now, what happens when it intersects? Then there are four segments. In the first segment, this dot is both below both of these lines. That means both of the species are going to win and go, try, will try to reach an equilibrium. This dot is above both these lines, so uh, the species will try to, will lose and will try to reach an equilibrium towards center. Same here. Uh, this, uh, this is below blue line and above yellow line, so species one will win. And this is above blue line and below yellow line, so species two will win. And here, that means that in these kinds of lines exist in nature in between two species, species one or two both can win, and uh, depending on the situation. But there can be a fourth situation where you see this uh, K1 and K2 values are inside now. Initially, the K1 and K2 values are outside. Now they're inside. The lines have just crisscrossed. Four situations. First situation remains the same. Second situation remains the same. Now the third situation and fourth situation will be such that all of these situations where the species will try to coexist. They will not try to outcompete each other, rather they will try to coexist. So species and one and two coexists. There are four situations in a lot of Altera model, Main, mainly four. There are many other types, but that's uh, enough for uh, this lecture. But there is a problem with this coexistence idea. Later on, uh, 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 Georgi Goss actually proposed this hypothesis. Two species with identical niche cannot coexist together indefinitely. That means ultimately one species will outcompete each other. So this is the limitation of Lotka Volterra model. That people found out later on that Lotka Volterra model can be good only if you consider predator and prey and not consider environment. Whenever you are considering environment, then the model actually is wonky, doesn't really uh, like work all the time. So they came up with this idea of competitive exclusion principle, principle that two species cannot coexist indefinitely, where they are both limited by the same resource. So uh, scientist Tillman uh, came up with this resource-based model. Same kind of idea like um, lotka volterra model, but rather than number of species being on the x and y axis, now you have resources. So resource was divided into A and B, and from the perspective of resource, there are different outcomes possible. This is not part of your syllabus, but if you really are interested, you can go and read about it. This is a fascinating part of how Lotka Volterra model can be further improved. I'll go, I'll quickly summarize uh, the extreme examples that can be used uh, where Lotka Volterra has been used. So, one example is using the same predator prey model. Now, the predator prey becomes anything. It can be two inanimate objects, and you can still apply Lotka Ventura model. And it was used to calculate different things in climate change. Or it can actually be utilized to calculate out different factors in host and parasite interaction. And many other things, enzyme kinetics, any other biological components where there are uh, predator-prey kind of interaction. Uh, uh, consumption and uh, uh, destruction. Incidentally, that uh, this kind of model has been used in cancer therapies as well. So where uh, the immune host immune system is the predator and the tumor cells are uh, the cells which uh, can generate or metastasize as tumors are uh, considered as, a, as the prey. And now, when the cancer will occur, when the tu a benign tumor can become a cancerous tumor, all of those calculations are also possible using lotka volterra models. Uh, similarly, uh, lotka volterra models were used to calculate out antibiotic resistance properties in bacteria. 
And recently, Lord Karavaltera model has been used to analyze uh, COVID-19 and uh, what is the outcome of COVID-19 infections. And this is in the early phases. Uh, the exact outputs will take some time to calculate. And with that, I'll go to the conclusion section. So what I really wanted to tell you is that, yes, you, there is lotka volterra model, but there are so many different aspects of mathematical model that you should explore. It is, there are things like uh, Bayesian network, the different network theories, information theories, uh, systems theories, which we, I cannot discuss this today. Uh, but if you are interested, you can really uh, just take an uh, ecology textbook and you'll find different aspects of it. Is it still? Am I still audible? Yes, you are. All right. Okay. Uh, so the take home message from today's talk is that there are two species, if there are two species which are competing against each other. The Lotka and Volterra postulated that species one will affect the number of species two, and the distribution they used was uh, Kolmogorov equations to calculate out the coefficient of competition that is alpha or beta in case of species one and two, respectively. And this is the only model where this, both of these species will coexist. So if you remember this, you and if you'll remember the gist of lotka volterra model. But what I want you to follow up is learn different aspects of mathematical modeling, which you can use for research, but also you can become a data analyst because lotka volterra model can be used in uh, different aspects of banking uh, sector calculations, uh, population growth, for uh, making predictions about what would be the economic policies of a government. So there are many ways these kind of mathematical models can be utilized. So you just open up that avenue for you, but just explore that possibility. And I thank you for your presence. I'll be happy to answer questions. So I request the students to ask the questions if they have any. Uh, so, Vic, so I think it's a nice presentation. Um, so what message do you want to convey to the students? Don't be afraid of mathematics. Mathematics is beautiful. OK, thank you. That's a nice suggestion to the students. So I think besides some minor technical issues, we really enjoyed your lecture. So on behalf of Geological Association of Baduan, Dr. Manavis Mojumdar will convey the sincere, uh, his sincere vote of thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm audible, Shyam? Yes, Hello. you are. Yeah, yeah. So thanks a lot, Shyam. With Aston pleasure, I congratulate and thank Dr. Shofik Bhattacharya for excellent, lucid, informative, yet highly academic lecture which surely will imbibe the sense of lotka Volterra concept deep into the sense of understanding in the mind of the students. I deeply thank the students for their cooperation and patiently hearing the lecture. I also thank the organizing personnel for nicely organizing the seminar. And with this few eulogy, I conclude the session. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. With this, we conclude the session. Thanks. Thanks.